Okay, so I'm going to, to talk about our efforts in enabling integrative biology by making use of uh, semantic web technologies within the context of, us, of the concept that we presented some time ago that is called the semantic systems biology. So what's semantic systems biology? It's actually just an extension or one specific type of systems biology that tries to combine semantic web technologies. So we are trying to stress or we are trying to make use of those, these technologies to try to make use or try to complement, let's say, the, system, the systems biology approach. You know that within the systems biology approach, normally there are some biological models probably using some uh, differential equations or stuff like that. So in our case, we are trying to make use of the semantic web technologies for the sake of knowledge, of biological knowledge management. So I'm going to be talking about, uh, yeah, quickly about the tools and the resources that we have been building. So probably some of you know the, the classical systems biology cycle where uh, well, basically we, we begin with a, uh, a biological model. In our case, basically what we, have, we are taking well, what, or we have, we have built is a knowledge base called BioGateway that contrary to the thing that uh, Vladimir just presented, it's still a warehouse because yeah, there are, you know the, the limitations. But anyway, this is our starting point, so the biological knowledge. So what we are doing with this knowledge is trying to first of all do consistency checking we are, of course, querying, we are interested in retrieving the things that we have stored there and trying to do also some semi-automated reasoning. But, okay, okay we, are, we have developed some tools that we are going to talk about quickly later about onto toolkit and all these things. So the aim of this is to, of course, try to generate some hypotheses. You know, users, biologists are interested in those things and so that they could design their experiments, improve their, yeah, the, the, the way they, they do the, the, their research. Actually, we are basically this uh, this time, this this last uh, months, we were busy on trying to be much more focused on this part of this semantic systems biology cycle. I mean, trying to, to generate much more hypotheses, trying to do some ontology alignment and stuff like that. Uh, we presented some results that were published some time ago. It was a very initial way to demonstrate how semantic web technologies could really help us to to do all these things. But now we are trying to do it in a much large. Uh, in a much larger scale, let's say. So that, of course, once we have our hypothesis, we could go back to our colleagues in the lab <coughs> and do the experimentation, generate data once again, okay, make use of our tools or other tools, and to, to extract information and formalize the knowledge and once again feed up uh, our knowledge base. So, by a great way, as I mentioned, collects information, biological information. This is just a sample piece of the information that is collected there. In the middle you can see, well, it's, sorry for the image, it's not that clear. It's just a protein which is circumvented or, or, uh, circled with uh, several different relationships. It's just to show what, what's the, what type of information we are capturing in this, in this uh, knowledge base, like uh, cellular localizations, molecular functions, and stuff like that. There is also a sparking endpoint that hopefully we, we will be able to use this week. Don't stress it too much if you are going to use it. Don't hack it, please. But, uh, anyway, so in this website you will be in, able to, to find already a, a set of around 40 uh, pre candid queries. So you can go to the website and just uh, choose one of them. You can customize your query, of course, like in this case, there is an example to, to retrieve the human proteins, for example, that are localized in the nucleus and that are involved in a given disease like diabetes, for example. So, to build BioGateway, uh, we, uh, we had uh, we constructed a, a pipeline, semi-automated semi pipeline, sorry, that uh, gathers the information that is listed there. One of the main components is SwissProt, for obvious reasons. It's curated data. It's uh, we know already what is what SwissProt is. But there are also information about uh, other other things like uh, yeah, taxonomy. We are also collecting the the, the entire set of all of our ontologies, the, the, and uh, we are also making use of uh, transitive closure to try to exploit the yeah, some sort of basic reasoning on on this knowledge base. On the other hand, we are also integrating the data from the gene ontology annotation uh, group. So, you know, there are a set of fl uh, flat files that have been digested, of course, translated into RDF and then uh, integrated in the, into our 
triple store, which is virtuoso actually. Okay, so by Gateway, it's what the aim is to support the concept I presented at the, at the, at the beginning. So the semantic systems biology, you, you see that all this cycle of uh, going from the biological knowledge to the hypothesis generation and all these things. So the, this uh, pipeline is run uh, once a year, sometimes twice a year to generate all this uh, information. And uh, actually we have been, we have spent a lot of effort in trying to, to tune our RDF. So we tried, to, at the beginning we originally, we were just importing the data and trying to collect the data without too, spending too much time on the quality of the data or, or the quality of the modeling, let's say. But now we realized after some performance issues we had that we had to really <coughs> remodel some pieces of, 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 of code, let's say, of RDF representation so that we could get faster replies, faster uh, answers from our system. We also spent time on uh, getting, of course, human readable output. As we also showed, it's important to try to reach biology somehow. Of course, we are not going to confront them to a SPARQL endpoint because they are going to get scared. But anyway, uh, we also try to find some, uh, well, follow some good practices, like uh, yeah, to follow standards and uh, try to, of course, not reinvent the wheel in not reintegrating or creating things that were already created by other, by other people, for example, like the, the resource of uh, Uniprot. As I mentioned also, we are all, we were trying to exploit the transitive closure, especially for, well, for, we did it for several relationships, but especially for East A and part of. We also try to combine those relations, so, you know, try to have some composition of relations like uh, East A and part of, you know, that at the end uh, generates an East A. So these sort of things. If you want more details, we can of course discuss later about this. This is just a quick example how we was a very simple example of the type of, of queries that we can answer if we have this search of uh, infrastructure, I mean the transitive closures, like the question that is written there that what are the proteins that are located in the nucleus, the cell nucleus of any subpart of it. So if we have such type of information already there, you can, you can easily see in the image that we can also retrieve things that we are not going to easily find them with a simple query. Uh, apart from the efforts of integrating data, other colleague was also busy trying to build some sort of visualization for this. Of course, this is a still an initial step because, you know, there are already nice tools like uh, the one provided by the NCBO to browse, to browse ontologies and stuff like that. But now uh, he tried to, to also yeah, develop something on his own and try to, to see whether we could uh, visualize our data uh, graphically, dynamically, and stuff like that. And part of our toolbox, uh, well, I mentioned already several tools, but the main two ones are Onto, Pair and Onto Toolkit. You can go to, for the details to the publications, but in, in a few words, basically, we're making use of these tools to do the analysis, to do the integration, to do the translation of, uh, of over formatted files into RDF and OWL and stuff like that, and also to not only check the syntax, for example, of the files, because you know there are many of the time we will all, if, if we want to have an automated pipeline to run it smoothly, we, are, we don't want to, to be facing all these little issues about if somebody forgot to, to properly type, for example, the tag in, a, in an OVO entry or something like that. And as we wanted to also reach end users, we implemented Onto Toolkit, which is basically something that interfaces Onto Perl, so the, <coughs> the set of Perl modules, through the Galaxy environment. I guess some of you know already the Galaxy framework. And uh, so that actually if having this enables, enables to the system to, to, to be able, for example, to, to compare results, to share results, to build workflows, compare data, include other annotations, or things like that. Finally, just a few words about uh, uh, some other efforts that other, other, other colleagues in our, in our team also were, what has, was busy. It's basic, he was basically trying to exploit or to try to do some reasoning with the OBO founder ontologies and trying to translate them into RDF. Well, he, he translated them actually to RDF he did an extension of all those type of relationships, and eventually he generated about 150 million new triples in our system, in our system, in our triple store. That, of course, are probably not all of them valid hypotheses, but it's already a starting point to to try to, of course, minimize the set of possible things that could be interesting to to analyze. Okay.
you mentioned uh, transit, transit closure and uh, it's something that uh, I, I think is a very important uh, uh, issue for uh, bringing some of the best of the semantic web to Sparkle users uh, in the sense that, for instance, that you can, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, an, an approach to property chaining of using ISA and part of um, or just the simple uh, subclass subsumption queries where uh, if I'm querying the human disease ontology for uh, neurodegenerative diseases, that, that, um, that, that query automatically matches whatever is characterized by human disease ontology as a neurodegenerative disease, which we part of Parkinson's, Huntington's, Alzheimer's, etc. At the moment, there uh, isn't clear implementation support for uh, Sparkle 1.1 tailment regimes uh, in all platforms, so you can't depend on using subsumption reasoning as an entailment regime in your query for most trivial scores yet. And I, I don't know, maybe that's changing as, as we speak. But, uh, uh, in, in the meantime, I think there's there's some question and issues that are brought up by this transit closure. It would, it would be interesting to discuss them uh, sometime during this uh, this uh, meeting. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's it, it's really uh, totally agree. And uh, yeah, actually for the in practical terms, when we were dealing with the transitive closure and all these things, we wanted to to try to see whether we could do all these things on on, on the fly. But eventually we decided to explicitly call in code, let's say, all those transitive closure relationships and the composition uh, or property chaining, let's say. So, yeah, there are technical limitations, of course, but uh, yeah, it would be interesting to, to follow up. This.